Hi guys, Olive here, here today to dig deep into Edith Wharton's 1905 novel, The House of Mirth. I just recently finished this book and I was so struck by it and its main character that I just had to take the time to make a video to go into all of it. I do feel the need to say that this video is probably best watched after you've already read the novel. But if you don't mind having some, not all, of the plot points spoiled for you, or if you would like this video to inform a first reading of the novel, please proceed. So let's lay the groundwork here. This book is about a woman in her late 20s named Lily Bart. She is born into a wealthy family, but we learn that her mother squandered away their entire fortune. After both of her parents die in what seems to have been her early 20s, her aunt takes her in. And this is the point at which we meet Lily. We learn that in Lily's younger years before her mother died, she had ambitions to marry not just for money, but also for freedom. However, once both of her parents die and her circumstances are laid out in front of her, she seems to change her mind. At the point when we meet Lily, she is seeking a husband for both security and for status. But even as she does so, she is acutely aware of just how unhappy that life is going to make her. There's a really great scene toward the beginning of the book where she is actively wooing a rich young gentleman. And considering how absurd it is that she's subjecting herself to his tediousness only to hope to earn the chance to be bored by him for the rest of her life. And yet there's no denying that she is a hit with men. We're told with no uncertain terms that Lily is gorgeous. She is certainly aware of it, and while her beauty alone would win her attention, she is also aware that that alone is not enough. She has to use it as a lure to reel men in. While we know on the very surface what Lily is chasing, a rich husband, we have to dig a little deeper to get at what she truly wants. Because if she knows that married life to a rich old boar is going to make her miserable, why is she chasing it so hard? I think this question is part of what makes her such a frustrating character to so many people because she seems contradictory. However, I think I know why she does what she does in this book, and a lot of it comes back to her mother. Some of the most important clues about Lily are in the first three chapters. We learn that she was raised by a mother who thought herself superior, not just in money because the extended family was rich as well, but in the way that she presented herself and through her very way of being. Her mother was motivated nearly entirely by how other people saw her, I have a passage I would like to read for you. Lily was naturally proud of her mother's aptitude in this line. She had been brought up in the faith that whatever it cost, one must have a good cook and be what Mrs. Bart called decently dressed. Mrs. Bart's worst reproach to her husband was to ask him if he expected her to live like a pig. And his replying in the negative was always regarded as a justification for cabling to Paris for an extra dress or two and telephoning to the jeweler that he might, after all, send home the turquoise bracelet which Mrs. Bart had looked at that morning. I mean, it's one thing to think you're better than others, but it's another to equate the way other people live to living like pigs. It betrays a thorough and malignant sense of entitlement. And her mother, once she's wasted the fortune, comes to see Lily as a type of possession. Wharton uses language to indicate that Lily's mother felt an ownership over her beauty as though she saw it as a statement of potential earnings. There is one super important line that Lily's mother says to her, and that's, but you'll get it all back you'll get it all back with your face. As I've grown older and have become a more experienced reader, I spend a lot more of my time looking for all those things that are not said on the page. I think those things that we can infer or those things that we have to imagine, those things that are purposefully left out can be the most telling of all. If Mrs. Bart, Lily's mother, was the type of woman who expected the world to grovel at her feet and was the type of parent who put all of her mistakes onto her young daughter for her to fix them at the end of her life. What kind of childhood do you think Lily Bart had? Probably not a great one. What kind of impossible standards was she held to? Probably backbreaking ones. Not only is she being told that all of her value is in her looks, but she's been given the responsibility to give her mother back the life that she deserves. I came to this conclusion because the proof is in the pudding. Lily thinks that all of her power and all of her value is in her appearance, and she is dead set on marrying rich, even though she really doesn't want to. 
So why is she chasing that rabbit that she doesn't actually want to catch? Because she feels obligated. And what I think is so transparent is that she won't marry just any rich man. He has to be loaded. We learn that she's turned down some perfectly good other options because she thought she could do better. I think that fact proves another one of my points that I'm going to be making later, but for now I feel it's enough to say that I think it's clear she's still trying to win her mother's approval even though she's dead. I think even if she did manage to snag a tycoon, she would feel compelled to glance upward and ask, I caught it all back. Am I good enough now? Another important thing to note, however, is that Lily definitely did inherit some of her mother's unfavorable characteristics. She definitely did not escape her upbringing without developing her own sense of entitlement. She has high class tastes. She thinks she deserves the best. It's another reason why she'll settle for nothing less than the richest husband she can find. This entitlement runs deep. It goes beyond physical possessions, and it gets her into trouble when it combines with her other characteristics of short-term thinking and impulsivity. Case in point, she gambles. She knows that gambling isn't a good idea. More or less, she tells us that she fears she has an addictive personality. God, is that important later on? But she plays bridge anyway and loses money she really can't afford to. She makes the terrible decision to basically get a loan from the husband of a friend of hers, mainly by flirting with him. And then things really start to go south for her when he expects her to return the favor. And then she gets close to a woman she has been told is dangerous and then is socially ruined when it backfires. All of this happens, and yet for a large portion of the book, Lily's voice is full of self-assurance. She is promising us that she can use her wit and her beauty to wedge herself out of these situations, and yet we see time and time again that she doesn't know the game she's playing. She's not a good gambler. Her arrogance and entitlement get her into just about every predicament that she finds herself in in this book. She would rather lie time and time again, even when honesty would help her cause, because just like her mother, she is obsessed with how the world sees her. She also thinks herself above every single warning she receives. Gambling, Bertha Dorset, sleeping pills. She thinks that all of these dangers don't apply to her. Thinking herself above people keeps her from seeing the reality of her situation. There are so many moments where you just want to scream at her because it's so obvious to us what's going to happen when she throws herself into these messes but she is blinded by her own shine. But I think she's as much of a tragic character as she is a frustrating one because she deprives herself of a happy life with Lawrence Selden, a man who loves her for who she is and not just the mask that she puts on because of this legacy she's inherited. And by that, I mean not just the obligation that she feels to return her family's name to prominence, but this legacy of entitlement that her mother passed down to her that is weighing Lily down and eventually sinks her. The saddest moment for me, the moment when Lily's defeat was well and truly solidified, wasn't even at the end of the book. It was when she burned the letters. She buys these letters earlier in the book, but by this point, they've basically become currency. She could release them and not only win her spot back in the social circle, but earn herself a husband. Every single person who's on her side is begging her to put them out there for the world to see. We don't see or hear Lily putting up a fight about this. She just doesn't do it. And we're never really given an explanation as to why. Once again, we have to infer. I think she makes the final decision to burn these letters, not only just to protect the man she truly loves, Lawrence Selden, that's certainly part of it. But I think there's more to it than that. I think she can't release the letters because it's not within her to do. I think Lily was never cut out for this lifestyle because she's not brutal. I've had some harsh words for Lily throughout this video. I think she is greedy and conceited, certainly, but she's not cruel. She's not willing to steamroll someone else for her own gain. And in this crowd, you have to. Judy Trenner, Lily's friend, says it right at the beginning of the book. Everyone knows you're a thousand times handsomer and cleverer than Bertha, but then you're not nasty. And for always getting what she wants in the long run, commend me to a nasty woman. To any of us, that sounds like a compliment. But upon application to the rest of this book, that's actually a flaw in the system if Lily wants to thrive in this set. At the end of the day, 
She's not nasty enough to do what it takes to get what she wants. What a damning portrait Wharton paints of basically her own society. There's more than a whiff of Darwinism to it, and not in the way that social Darwinism skewed it. But in order to survive in the wilds of New York City, one must be ruthless. And if that's the case, then Lily is maladapted to the life that she's trying to win. When it comes down to it, she finds herself unable to hand over the evidence that will secure her victory. Probably because it's just not in her DNA. That ship may be beautiful, but she will sink. There is so much more I could say, and there are so many more passages I could read from to drive my point home, but this video is way too long already, so I will leave it there for now. I would love to hear your thoughts on this book or any of the points I made in this video. You can put that in the comment section below, or you can find me on a variety of different places on social media. The links to all of my profiles are linked in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.